Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I really enjoyed coming and doing these programs. And Heidi asked me to uh, take a little bit of a break from our regular programming and a variety of things and get back to grassroots and Washington butterflies, which I enjoy. And uh, so this time I decided uh, to spend some time with the lesser fritillaries and the crescents. And the main reason I picked that is I pretty well knew when she asked me that we were probably going to go to Oroville this year. And some of these rarer species that are in these two groups are going to be perfect timing in June to see on the field trip, uh, with the exception of one, which comes out in May. But the rest of them should be in prime time. If we have good weather, June is always chance as you know. We don't know what's going to happen in June. But if we have good weather, we should be able to see some of these. And so it'll make it really worthwhile. So we're going to start out with the lesser fritillaries. Oh, pointed at the... Oh, once again, I got pointed at her. There we go. I got to learn to do that. Okay. Okay, the lesser fritillaries belong to the nymphalics. We're, we're dealing with the nymphalics with both the crescents and the, and the lesser fritillaries. And the nymphalids, as you probably know now, I know a lot of you are, <laughs> know a lot about butterflies and some of you do not. So I don't want to talk down to anybody, but on the other hand, I'll try to explain things the best I can at a very basic level. But uh, they're called brushfoots. And the reason I call brushfoots is this family of uh, butterflies has the first pair of legs that are vestigial. In other words, they are very reduced, very tiny. They, they generally just hold them right close up to their body. And uh, as it says, they are small in size, hairy and brush-like. But they're really not functional. They don't really use them to perch. And uh, so this kind of designates this family as one unique group, the nymphalidae. Well, uh, the lesser fertilizers are in this group. Uh, the members that we, we have in our state all belong to the genus Valoria, and which we call the lesser fertilizers. Now, you can see that the word Valoria comes from the Greek word bolos, which uh, means fishing net. And I said, hmm, let's think about this now. Fishing net. Well, when you look at the dorsal surface of these, you'll see this, I think. If you, if you use your imagination a little bit, you'll see that the orange and black is a pattern such that it actually looks like a net like appearance. And so, this must, which when the people that named this, must have been thinking about when they named it that. Now, they're called lesser fritillaries, not because they're not important. When I gave this talk, I said, well, oh, people won't come to this. Lesser fritillaries, they want to see. Greater fritillaries. It's lesser because of their size. They're, they're much smaller than the greater fritillaries on average. Of course, there, there's some variations within each group. There's some greater fritillaries that are smaller, and there's some lesser fritillaries that are larger. But on an average, they're smaller in size. So this is what we call them the lesser fritillaries, and the greater fritillaries, of course, have a much larger size normally. Now, the dorsal surface of these are all fritillary-like, fritillary -like, so they're going to look very much like the greater fritillaries. You're going to look at these and say, wow, how am I ever going to tell these apart? It is very difficult to distinguish these, especially for a novice. If a person is out in the field and doesn't know much about butterflies, they're going to look at one of these and think they're all the same. All the fritillaries are going to look alike. But people that, are, that work with these extensively are even able to use, oftentimes, the dorsal surface to distinguish these, which is really an achievement. Uh, what we do, what I do particularly, uh, to identify these is I look at the ventral surface. The ventral surface is what's important, and not only the ventral surface, but the ventral hind wings. If you're going to tell these apart, that's your very best chance of doing this, looking at the ventral hind wings, and look at the patterns, because their patterns and markings are going to all be different. Another difference between the uh, lesser fritillaries and greater fritillaries is that the lesser fritillaries generally do not have silver spots. Generally, now be careful, generally they don't have silver spots. There are some that do. And the greater fritillaries mostly have silver spots, but there are some of those that don't. So you can't use it at a 100% rule, but it works for, for most of them, at least in our area. So it makes it nice for Washington State because it's pretty simplistic for us here compared to what it is the rest of the world. There's 14 species of lesser fritillaries that find in North America, and we have uh, 
Actually, we have six. I don't know why I said five. That's a typo. We have six that fly in Washington. Um, but we have 14. And these have a tendency to be more northern. And so, in other words, when we look at the lesser fertile areas, we're kind of on the southern outpost of these. As you go further north, you will see more. So you get more into these 14. Uh, because it's, a, it's really a northern butterfly. Okay? So we're kind of on the, the southern fringe of these. Now, there's 17 species of fly in Europe. And that isn't so bad, except that, unfortunately, in Europe, the lesser fritters also includes some more genera. <laughs> Besides Gloria, they have Plossiana, Proplossiana, they have Melicta, and Melity. They all fly in Europe. And you look at them, and they look pretty much the same. But they have, the Europeans have discovered ways to make sure they put them in different genera and they are the same. I haven't studied these very thoroughly, so I don't know all these differences, but uh, I do know that there's a lot more of the lesser fritters in Europe than we have here. And once again, mostly north. If you look at the typical habitat of this group, they're Arctic North, Alpine Meadows. You can see that they really prefer cool, high elevation areas, bogs, um, and then there's one particular that we're going to study that we might be able to see on the the uh, conference, and that's the Frayford area that's part of the taiga. Now, the taiga is the great north coniferous forest. It goes all the way into Canada, and it just hangs a little bit into Washington State and Okanagan County. And in that area, we get a chance to see one of those special butterflies. Did you see some of them at the Tarts Pass oh. a while ago? The uh, fray I don't know. The, I don't think it was the fray. No, some of the lesser didn't I, I don't know. You won't see that at Hearts Pass. Okay. It's, it's only a bog butterfly. Marsh and it's a coniferous forest. It's, it's up in D.C. and then, and then it, uh, that long swamp area. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a possibility on uh, the conference. Because yeah, it's not that far out of Oregon. So some of you either, I was considering doing <clears> that maybe before or after the conference. If some of you, you know, come early or come later, you might want to make a side trip over to uh, 30 Mile Creek and Long Swamp. You, know, you, to see you might be thinking of Gloria starting. We saw, we saw some, oh, you're thinking of the starting? We saw some lesser, at least one is lesser up there. Yeah, Gloria so, starting. The starting. So. Yeah, yeah starting. That, that's true. Yeah. Okay. okay, now I'm going to give you, I'm going to start out uh, giving you just a few examples of some of the European Gloria, though. I'm not looking at the others. I thought, well, I have to give examples of these other genera. I said, no. <laughs> Let's don't get into that. Let's just stick, stick closer to home. But I am going to give some examples of European malaria. This one flies in Russia, uh, the Autaki of uh, Fritillary. Um, and once again, this will show you the problem with the dorsal surfaces. Um, like I say, they look typically fritillary. Like right? You're going to look at this and say, well, that's like a greater fritillary. Yeah, it does. It does look like it, doesn't it? But it's only an inch and a half wingspan which is relatively small, and the greater fruit areas probably be larger than that. But uh, you can see the coloration and all. It's very consistent. And can you see the netting at all? I mean, can you use your imagination and see kind of a fishnet? Uh, I see it right in here, and in here, and kind of in here. This is where they get the, the name, uh, the genus name from that fishnet kind of appearance. And at least that's, that's the way I look at it. Now, if we look at the uh, ventral surface of this butterfly, once again, we're going to focus on the ventral hind wings because this is going to be where they're going to be defending. This is where you're going to be able to tell them apart. And this particular one, it's very interesting to me. When I look to study these, when I even studied my own specimens for my own book, I spent a lot of time uh, with a microscope looking at these patterns and trying to say, now, what is unique about these? Well, take a look at this. Here's a tropical butterfly right there. You see its wing? There's a high wing, there's a low wing. There's just two spots there, a nice face of area. Isn't that a beautiful little tropical butterfly? A butterfly and a butterfly. Now, most people with Gloria pilot don't even see that. But that's, that is unique. You won't see that in the other Gloria that we have. And so that is special. Another thing that you look for is the patterns of these bands. This is uh, pretty much yellow here. 
there's an orange band here, but you, this kind of breaks down here. You have a yellow spot here. And then, of course, you have um, crescents to look at, and you have the marginal spots to look at. What you do is when you identify these things, you've got to look at all, all, of, all of the arrangement of those spots, whether there's patterns to them, what kind of patterns they are. This is how you're able to do this. And if you're successful in doing that, you won't have any trouble with the freelancers. Okay, let's look at another European one. This flies in the Swiss Alps, Shepherd's Fritillary. Now look, it's the similar in the dorsal surface. It's a little different. If you look at it, you can see, well, it's got a lot more black in here. So it is different there, but it's still got the same basic patterns with the spots here. And uh, the, the netting pattern kind of breaks down a bit more here. But, but it there. it's difficult. I mean, you know, we're not going to sit there and focus on the dorsal surface and oh, we're going to figure these out by the dorsal surface. No, it's just too difficult to do that. Let's take a look at the, uh, the ventral surface of it. Uh, now, you see this is a little bit different. Um, you can see now that we have a nice, nice solid band here that actually almost makes a Y on the yellow. It comes down here, comes down here. Here's that tropical butterfly again, but it doesn't look kind of like the other one. Does it? it kind of looks messed up. It's not quite as distinct as the other one. And so that's different. And, uh, and then we have these nice, broad spots here. So you can see, once again, this is how, this is how we attack these fritters. We look for patterns. We look at the way they, uh, they appear on the ventral hymen. Uh, oops, did I go backwards? Oh yeah, no, this is the third one. The third one I'm going to show you the last one. Then I'm going to get to ours. Uh, Weaver's fruit letter. Uh, this also flies in Russia. Now this one is a little darker on it. Now you might look at the dorsal surface of this. If, if you've been kind of following the others, notice that, wow, this has got a lot more black in it. And the reason it has a lot more black is these spots are bigger and these, these lines are there. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it the difference. It isn't that there's more black on it. It's just that the black is bigger. And therefore, it makes it kind of dominate the orange. So now, uh, some person might want to look at the dorsal surface of this and say, well, you know, I can tell that apart from some of the others that fly in the area. But it's still difficult when you're dealing with that dorsal surface. Now, the ventral surface, whoa, slam dunk. This is much different. <coughs> they look here. For the first time, we've introduced lavender into our color pattern. See, you have lavender in here now. And also, you get the first look at one of the real uh, characteristics of some of our gloria, the canine tooth. It's there. And you didn't see that in the other stage. It wasn't there. But it is in this one, and it is in some of ours in our state. So we'll see that. And uh, so... Uh, you have this lavender in here now, and you've got these spots that are brown. Can you see the different pattern there? And it's all checkered, and it's all mixed up. <coughs> so this is, uh, this is what makes the Weaver's Fritillary very distinct. All right, well, let's get to ours. Come on, let's get to ours. There's enough of this pulling around, okay? Let's get to Washington State. We have six species that fly in our state. The first one is going to be our exception. This is the one that has silver spots. Okay, now the uh, silver board Fritillary is one that's going to be on our list for Mount Hall. Uh, in fact, one of the specimens I, I have here, I'll show you, the female, I collected them now. So, and June. So we, we should be able to find this if we find any marshy areas. <coughs> We've got to look for the habitat. This, is, this prefers really wet areas where there's violets growing. And so you have to be in the right place. It's not going to be on a dry road. It's going to be a place where you're going to have some meadows that are pretty marshy. So when we look at those, We'll take a look. We'll probably be lucky enough to see the silver border thriller. Now, this butterfly is pretty well restricted to northeastern Washington. Uh, there's a lot of records in Okanagan County, and there's a lot of records in Ponderay County. Then there's other scattered records. Uh, one population I found was at the Delaney Interpretive Center in Sun Lake State Park. I was there, and when I was down there, wow, there's a nice little population. In fact, I took John Pelham. He didn't believe me that they flew there, and I had to show him. He, in fact, we, we got one on that trip, and I showed him. I said, John, this is a silver board flute. You're right, he said. <laughs> it's there. So I proved it to him that it flew there. And also, if you go further south, there was one other colony that's all isolated called the Moxie Bog. Now, the Moxie Bog is an interesting story. I'm going to make it kind of short, but the Moxie Bog is the first place I ever saw this butterfly. This was before it was protected. This is when it was just part of the farm. And I went out there and I had to fight the cattle to go out there into the bog. 
the cattle were everywhere, and here I was, and I was looking for these butterflies, and they were there. They were there, no question about it. Well, the Nature Conservancy purchased the land. And what did they do? They kicked the cattle out. And what happened? The population crashed. The population crashed. This is when we, we love a butterfly to death. Why do you think the population crashed? What did the cattle eat? Grass. Grass. What happens when you don't let them graze on the grass? The grass grows. And it took over the whole bog, and it was destroying the, the host uh, larval plant. And so the population was going down. Now, I haven't been to the Moxie bog in years. Have any of you been there in the last five years? You have. What's the state of today? David James checked it out, I think, monthly last year, and for the year before, he's not seen a single bit of that. Yeah, it's gone. This is where, you know, we have the best intentions in the world to protect something, but we don't have the ecology to back it up. We don't understand what we're doing. What were they trying to protect? The Nature Conservancy. They didn't, they didn't want the cattle in there because they were going to destroy the butterfly. Oh, so they had the butterfly in mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. They, had, they were going to protect this butterfly because it's the only southern colony we've got. They were going to keep it. And so they, I believe they even fenced it. Didn't they, they even fence the area? Yeah, that's what kept the cattle out of there. Yeah, and so they kept the cattle out of there, and the grasses grew. <clears throat> and Lepidopterus, like Bob Pyle, John Pyle, told them, let the cattle back in, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't do it. Yeah. And so now the butterfly's probably gone. So it's an extinct population now. And it was with the cattle when I was there. I had to have the cattle move over when I was moving around in the bog. But the butterfly was everywhere. They was doing it. They coexist beautifully. Do you know which violet they were using there? No. I, David will probably be able to tell you. Which violet were they using? <clears throat> I think Lobella. It's the yellow one. Okay, the yellow one. Lobella. Okay. At least my yellow one, probably Lobella. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know, David is our expert on larval food plants. So when a question comes to me about larval food plants, they will be directed right to David. Yeah. He's the expert. If we go up to Marion Creek on our, on our retreat, our annual meeting, uh, there are lots of silver borders up there. And the place where they're the, the thickest, where you find the most, is where the cattle just get completely chomped down the ground. Mm -hmm. so they, it's the same with Tiger Meadows? You look at the Tiger Meadows, you know, they have all the cattle in there. Oh, yeah. And uh, anywhere where it's wet, you yeah. buy where there's just a, mm -hmm. the silver border fruit are thick in there. Yeah. And the grass is down to nothing, right down to the ground for the cattle. So you see, they coexist with cattle just fine. But we have to learn these things. You know, we protect things, we've got to research it, we've got to figure out what's going on. All right, let's take a look at this. This is the, um, the dorsal surface. You can see that the orange predominates over the black. And so it looks like a very orange butterfly. Uh, but I want you to zero in on this. This is very important because one of our rare species is different from this. This has a very rounded apex. Keep this in mind. But notice that the orange dominates. But other than that, it's pretty hard to tell this butterfly from the dorsal surface. Let's look at the ventral surface. Now, this one's easy. It's our only lesser fruit there in the state of Washington that has silvered spots. So that will be a sign of if we're up there, for example, Mount Hole, and you get a little tiny foot thriller, you catch it in your net, and you look at it, silver spots, okay, you got it. That's it. So you have silver spots, you've got marginal silver spots, silver spots there, and uh, then you also have uh, these, these spots here also, these uh, marginal spots are also, seven large uh, pyramid-shaped silver spots. And also, if you notice here, the crescents are well marked, very marked, very thick, very distinct. And other than that, you can see that it's pretty much a regular shaped spots with a mix of colors, orange, yellow. So this is pretty much it. But the, the key you want to know here is the rounded tip and the silver spots. So if you can remember that, that will help you with the silver border trailer. And it's a small butterfly with this size. Inch and a half on span. So we're looking at a small butterfly. Female is very much like the male, so we won't dwell on the female. Just want to show you, there's no sexual dimorphism here. They're pretty much the same, so uh, we're going to move on to the next one. Uh, the next one is a special one, and I hope uh, that some of you will be able to see this. 
we're going to be there in prime time for this butterfly, and it's very rare. I mean, when I say rare, it is, it's very restricted to only certain areas. Uh, this is called the metal fritillary. The metal fritillary uh, is found basically in Okanagan County. These, these are a record show, Okanagan County and Ferry County. And uh, the best place, that, the only place I found it is in Moses Meadows. And that's on the way up to the conference. And it's the right prime time. So if you go early enough, in fact, that's what I plan to do. I plan to leave early enough in the morning or the day before. And I'm going to go to Moses now so I can get some more photographs of this. And uh, when I went up there the first time, it was in June, prime time, beautiful day. I was up in Moses Meadows and I spent the whole day in the meadows. And then get full of butterflies of all different kinds. That's another really motivating place to go. Butterfly. It's just great. But I didn't see a single metal fruit. And I was there all day. And I said, something's wrong here. Prime time, I you know, went to all the, the records and the books and everything. I was there prime time, everything. I said, what is going on? There's no metal for the here. So next year I said, well, I must have done something wrong. I don't know, but I went about the same time period in, in uh, June. And uh, I went up to Moses Meadows again. And it was a hotter day, beautiful day in June. Same thing, I didn't see it. Saw so, well, everything else I wanted to see, but I didn't see it. Then it got so hot, I said, well, I'm going to take my lunch, I'm going to go into the woods. And they have these rudimentary logging trails, logging roads, you know, just dirt roads throughout the forest. And I walked in there and sat down in a clearing. <coughs> and here they were. They were in the forest. I was looking out in the meadows. You know, here's a meadow fritillary, but actually it was in the forest. It was actually, they were flying in the forest, and there were lots of them. They were flying in the forest, and they would land on flowers, nectar on flowers, that were in openings in the forest. It was just unbelievable. Now, I don't know whether that was just an apparition. Other people may say, oh, we find them all the time in the meadows. I didn't. I found them in the forest. So if I go up there again, that's exactly where I'm going to go, is into those forests, because they fly amongst the trees, the pine trees there, and, uh, and that's where this, this photo was taken. All right, so this is the, uh, the meadow for learning. Is there, uh, is there a second so-called meadow fritillary in North America, uh, an eastern species and a well, western species? Well, there's a western meadow fritillary too, and that's on my list next. This is the meadow fritillary. This is baloney. Okay, the baloney. Is this, this is a unique species. Eastern. Okay. This so, should be allowed to make names the meadow and the western meadow. Yeah. Well, that's what we use in in, in Washington. <laughs> so we're going to try to not make it complicated and make sure that we stick pretty much with what we use in our state. So this is the metal for the learning. All right, let's take a look at the dorsal surface. Now, this is the main characteristic I want you to remember for this. If any of you go up to Moses Meadows, go into the forest, want to look for them, because uh, it'll be just prime time during the conference. It's just perfect timing if you get a good day. Look at this. Flat. It's our only lesser fritillary that has a flat, Wing apex. Absolutely flat. It's the only one. So if you see this, happen to net, <laughs> catch it, and you look at that, that's all you need to do. You don't need any other information. That is the Western fritter. Right there. Because otherwise you look at it and you say, well, <laughs> I don't know. It looks orange and black to me. It looks like a fritter. It is pretty much like the others that we've already seen, and it's very hard to uh, describe. But, of course, if you look at the ventral surface, then of course it is a lot different. Now, once again, with my little techniques of, I have all kinds of little ways to tell things apart. I call this the Samara characteristic. Oh, I don't know if you know what a Samara is. A Samara is the fruit of a maple, of a maple tree. And it, it has a little nut on it, and it has a wing. Oh. Now, to me, that's the seed. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it's very distinct in this butterfly, and it's the only one that, we, that flies in our state that has that distinct characteristic. So uh, I call it the Samara characteristic. So that's one way to identify this butterfly. But there's others as well. Um, this has a real thick kind of lavender band. Now that in itself isn't good enough to know that it's just a nice thick, the, uh, the margin is a uh, big thick um, lavender band because it is, this one is broken up by kind of yellow, orange, uh, markings inside. So it's kind of lavender here, lavender there, but it's broken up in the middle. Now keep that in mind. That's a very important characteristic to remember. 
that is, it makes it unique. Plus, it also has these, notice these cells here, all yellow, but they're polka dotted with red, or orange, or orange brown. It's hard to determine exactly what color those are, but uh, those are all polka dotted. And then there's a big band of this in the basal area. So keep that in mind. Those are the characteristics to kind of keep in your mind for the metal fritillary, because that'll help you um, decide, you know, that you have this species. So the flattened margin, the Samara, the, the lavender band that's interrupted in the middle, and this is this spe the speckled yellow spots here. Keep that in mind. That'll help you with this, this butterfly. But remember, this butterfly is quite uncommon. You're going to have, the only place I found it myself has been in the forested areas around those meadows. That's the only place. But it does fly, and there's other places where it's been seen. I don't know, maybe David, you found another place, but this is the only place I've, I've seen. Marion Creek. Yeah, it is Marion Creek too. It's there. Good, wonderful. And this is the female. The female, once again, is very similar. Uh, you don't have a lot of sexual dimorphism in uh, the lesser fertilizers. <coughs> the females are pretty much like the males, so we won't need to dwell on that any further. Okay, now this is the western male fritillary. Oh, we're getting confusing, yeah. This is Epiclor. This is, uh, uh, but this one's a lot different. This one's a lot more common. This is what you're going to see. In fact, I think we've seen nice colonies of this out to Huya, mm -hmm. out in your area. Uh, I was in a nice little meadow once out there by a forest, and it was really thick, right on red sea level. So this butterfly flies in western Washington, as well as central Washington. And uh, it's even uh, even found in other places beyond that. Um, it's uh, they have records of it in the Selkirks and also the Blue Mountains. So so it's it's pretty widely distributed. It's pretty common, and, and, it, and it flies from sea level all the way up to mid uh, elevations in the mountains. So you can see this uh, basically in, in the uh, you know the mountainous areas of Washington State as well, as long as it's not the high the real high trails. High trails, this gives way to another um, or species that we'll, we'll talk about. Okay, uh, so this one is widely distributed, much more common, and this is one that most of you probably have already seen if you haven't. Uh, most of you will see it. Uh, this is quite common. The, uh, the, dor the dorsal surface of this is very fertile like, once again, very much orange. You can see the orange really dominates this one. Uh, the black markings are very reduced on this. And also, we get back. To this rounded apex. Remember, the metal fritillary had that flat spot there on the on the apex. This is this is rounded. So right there, you can tell the two apart. Um, haven't been going any further than that. This specimen was collected at uh, Crystal Mountain, where it's abundant, up in the ski area. And uh, here is the ventral surface. And now, remember, I told you to remember that lavender characteristic that was interrupted. Take a look at this. Barely interrupted, if at all. Just these two little cells in here look yellow, but it's pretty much lavender all the way here. So that's another characteristic to separate the two metal fritillaries. Okay, that really thick lavender margin. And also take a look at this yellow band that has red on the outside and kind of reddish orange, I guess it's called reddish orange, brownish on the inside. It's got the yellow band is separated by two red. Now that makes it unique. So that will see, help you separate that from the metal fritillary. Okay, and plus this is so much more common. If you find it in western Washington, you know you don't have the, the metal fritillary, you have the western metal fritillary. The female, once again, very similar. So we'll move on. Freya's fritillary. This is the one we're talking about. It's a tiger butterfly. This loves coniferous, uh, Canadian coniferous forests, marsh, boggy areas. Uh, this photograph was taken in 30 Mile Creek uh, Marsh, or uh, the bog. And uh, this butterfly, like I say, only comes into our state in just that Okanagan area there where that Canadian taiga just reaches across the border for a short way. Now, there's probably, it's probably pretty extensive if you're a hiker, but the trouble is there's not many roads up in that area, so you basically have to kind of use the roads available to find it, and the best place to see this is Long Swamp, just the closest, that's, that's above the Sinlehican, and that's west of Oroville, 
or go further and go to 30 mile creek and the nice big huge open marshy area it's a lot more abundant in there than it is long swamp and uh, that's where i got most of my photographs of this thing but it's uh it's a tricky butterfly uh i don't know what experience you had david but when i was trying to get this these things would you can see them fly to the ground <laughs> but try to find them on the ground and so you walk slowly and try to get up to them and you get right up to them, and then they have this nasty habit of flying into the trees. <laughs> you know, most butterflies, if you scare them up, what do they do? Go another 20, 30 feet and light each other, right? <clears throat> Not these guys. They go up into the, the conifers. And so you keep looking. And so I think it took me quite a while before I could get close enough to even hardly see one up close uh, because of this habit. So, so they're, they're, they're kind of a difficult butterfly to deal with the odds. We had a massive forest fire that went all the way from Winthrop up to the Canadian border back about three years ago. Oh boy. And uh, we've got all of the known areas where Freya is. Oh, and so uh, I haven't heard anybody uh, say that they found it since then, but oh, no. I'm not sure anybody's looked. Yeah. But, but you know, it'll come back down from Canada. I mean, it depends on how extensive it was. But they'll, they'll migrate back down, I'm Maybe. sure, eventually. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's bad news. Yeah, but that fire hit Long Swamp and it hit 30 mile meadows. Oh, and there's another site cleared down closer to Winthrop where they historically have been found to hit that. They're yeah. hit all of them. Oh, that's sad. That's yeah. sad to hear. Host on this? Uh, it's a vaccine, is a vaccinium, well, what's the, what's the, what's the species stuff? name? Is that little dwarf? Uh, um, the, the, the dwarf huckleberry? Dwarf, uh, dwarf bilberry. Okay. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Vaccinium cesspitosis is not cesspitosis. Yeah, that's what it is. I don't know that's the one. Yeah, for him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's a real low plant. It's six inches tall. Maybe a second one that grows lower on average. Yeah. And they have tiny little red berries. Okay, the dorsal surface of this, now this butterfly is a little darker. Um, Compared to the other lesser fritz we have, you notice that the black is a little bit, the spots are bigger, the, uh, the markings are whiter, so it makes it look a little darker than the other. But other than that, it's fritillary light, as we've seen all the way along. Rounded, rounded apex, but we got to get to the ventral surface. Now this is where we see that canine tooth again that I was talking about, and this is probably the primary characteristic to identify this by, at least I use it. Uh, you have this canine tooth here, and it touches this white line. Now that's also significant. You don't have that in the other Gloria. We don't have that white line, but you have a white line, and the tip of the tooth touches that line. If you see that, you notice that this is part of a band, but the rest of the band is orange. But the one canine tooth is outlined in white. And so this makes it distinct, and it makes it very visible, and this is a good characteristic to remember this line. I think that would be very helpful for you to look at that. Uh, other things are you've got you know the model color. Look at here, you've got the orange yellow uh, area. You have black crescents here that you see. There's some other little characteristics too, but I think the number one characteristic you want to look for is this, and of course the rounded apex once again is good to know. That's the Freya. That's the the male ventral. The female once again very similar. No sexual dimorphism. Yes. On the ventral side, the markings looked more distinct than on the other species we've seen, and kind of. It is. Kind of it is. I think lines. you're right. Uh, the markings are pretty distinct, aren't they? They're well outlined. All the cells are outlined. The, the veins are outlined well, and that that's something also to remember. It's everything is marked very very well on here, and oh, another thing I forgot altogether. Look at here. It's got double crescents. Got crescents here, and I forgot to tell you about these. It's got a double layer of crescents. You don't see that very often. Usually they're very, they're right on the margin. But you've got crescents here too. So that's another characteristic. I forgot all about it. Thanks for having me go back there. I would have passed right over that. Could you go back to the photograph again? In the wild. In the wild. Oh, in the wild. In the wild. Very right. dark. Let's see that dark. That's really dark. Yeah. Yeah. Really dark. yeah. Well, it might be kind of the lighting too. You know, you get kind of fooled. Uh, you use different lighting when you do indoor photography. This is outdoors, and this was. This was later in the afternoon, I remember too, and it was in the shade. This one. So I, you know, and also 
I have to admit too, this is uh, that's one of the reasons I want to go up there and take more pictures. This is from uh, film, and now I do everything digitally, and I get a lot better pictures of my digital photography. And this was taken from film. This is from a slide. So uh, the photography isn't quite as good. So you can kind of blame the photography more than anything. Uh, but uh, you can still see, you can see that nice white. You see the white line and the canine tooth there. That, it's very. That's what you want to dwell on. That uh, is very, very special. And that it will help you with this butterfly. More than anything. Yes. Yes. Uh, at uh, Long Swamp, which is the easier place to get to. Uh, the, the Frey Friddle area and, and the Western Middle Friddle area uh, fly together at the same time. Um, I don't think they exactly overlap, but they're, um, there's at least part of their flight period when they're both present. And Joe and I found that uh, when you go out in the marshes there, you can tell at a, at a glance which one you have because the Western Middle is kind of a bright orange orange and the yeah. Frey is, is a subdued It's darker. It's yeah, darker. Yeah. Subdued orange. Yeah. And plus they fly differently. <laughs> Yeah, well, At least my experience with the fray is that, boy, when it's off, it's off. <laughs> have you ever seen them go off? The you haven't. Oh, they sure were down at the 30 Mile Creek. Mm -hmm. Go right. Of course, it was late in the afternoon when I was there. It was like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so it's late. And maybe, you know, that time of day, you know, they're, they, they're finished basically getting down. And maybe it's time to get to the trees. So I don't know the conditions, but, uh, but boy, they sure took off. Whereas the Western Metal for that, right? Eyes around, goes to another spot. So they have a little different, uh, they say have different characteristics. Okay, now the Sardi. Now I think this is one you're talking about of a slate bee. This is our largest uh, of our malaria, and uh, I think it's it's my favorite. But it's also one of the rarest. And uh, this one flies only in the, well, I shouldn't say only because there's always going to be, a person's going to find it somewhere else. Let's put it this way. Our records are basically for Okanagan County, right next to the Canadian border almost. Uh, the Shasta Wilderness uh, area is where you can find it. I suppose if you were a mountain climber, a hiker, backpacker, and you went anywhere in the North Cascades, high enough elevation, ridges and whatever, and did a lot of exploring, Pusaten. you would probably find a lot more habitats for this Pusaten, too. Pardon? In the Pusaten. Yeah, Pusaten Wilderness, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but we have to mainly, we go by where roads are. And so the best place to see this is up at Slate Peak, which is out of Mazama. For those of you who don't know where that is, go to Mazama in eastern Washington, near Winthrop. Mm -hmm. And then you go north up to Hearts Pass Road and all the way to Slate Peak. You go to the top, about 7,000 feet elevation. But that's where this butterfly flies. And, uh, and it's pretty restricted to very high, high elevation. And it has a two-year life cycle. So this is the right year for it. But I'm afraid we're going to be early. I, I hate to have anybody go up to Slate Peak in June. I think we're going to be snowed in. But uh, usually, because uh, when I my experiences were basically late July uh, to see this butterfly, and maybe early August. So June, maybe a little bit early. I've got an interesting story to tell you about this. I know we're going to kind of run late. But let me let me run this past you because uh, one of my students from Africa that I taught. I had the students all do uh, projects in the in the African bush, and uh, they could pick different things, plants or whatever, and they all did when I taught there. And one of my students was from Holland, and uh, he was really interested in butterflies, and of course, <laughs> he and I matched up beautifully. I said, good, I'll even go out with you. Mm -hmm. And so we went out together, and he made a butterfly collection of African butterflies and so forth. Anyway, uh, he wanted me to help him uh, get educated in the United States after he graduated from our school. He went to Switzerland to finish high school, and from Switzerland, he wanted to come to the U.S., and so I helped him get into the University of Puget Sound, which he got his degree in business at the University of Puget Sound. He now lives in Tel Aviv, Israel. But uh, anyway, I coerced him into coming up with him, because he's really a lepidopterist. He just loves butterflies. I mean, he would go crazy any time after butterflies. That was the first thing on his agenda. And he was single, which was really good. So he didn't have a wife to hold him back or a girlfriend. So I didn't go. <laughs> so anyway, I told him, I said, well, I want to go to Slate Peak, and I want to get some of these historic frillers from my book once and get some photos. And so I said, would you come up with me? He said, sure, in a heartbeat. So we went up to Hart's Pass, and we went up. And we didn't want to camp Hart's Pass. We decided to drive all the way up to Slate Peak, and this is probably illegal, but we did it anyway. We actually parked in the parking lot of Slate Peak, and we actually camped overnight there. 
<laughs> we didn't get so. caught, so we were okay. But then we did that, and we just kind of tailgated, and we had our camps over and everything, so we took our meals and everything. But what I wanted to tell you, the bottom line of this conversation, is that I found out something about the Starry Fruit Alert that I didn't know. And that is, it was a beautiful July day. There was not a breath of wind. It's one of those perfect days in the mountains where it was just absolutely sunny, warm, you know, shirt sleeve weather at 7,000 feet elevation, not a cloud in the sky. It was just ideal. And we were sitting there eating dinner, and started, the sun was starting to set in the west, and I started seeing orange going through. And I don't know how many of you have ever been up Slate Peak. Okay, now you notice on the way up to Slate Peak, they have all these boulders that line the road that go all the way up to the lookout. You know where the lookout is on top? Okay, and you have all these huge boulders. Okay, I saw this orange going into those boulders. And I says, his name is Duco. Duco Cano. Does that sound like a Dutch name? Anyway, so I said, Duco, let's, uh, let's investigate. What is this orange? So we both walked up there, and we watched it. And here they were, almost sundown. All of these Astari Fritillaries were coming into the crevices of the rock to spend the night. Mm -hmm. That's where they spent their night. Because they get out of the wind, they get out of the rain. Mm -hmm. I thought it was ideal. Yeah, How smart are they? The rocks will eat. Yeah, yeah, and the heat mm -hmm. of the day of the rocks yeah. keeps them warm yeah. all night. It was almost a perfect setting for them, and I could not believe it. They were coming in. We must have saw, I've seen maybe 30, 30 mm -hmm. or 40 of them do this, come into the rocks. And of course, they were very abundant when we were there, so we were really lucky. We really hit them. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, anyway, this is sorry for Larry. Let's take a look at the dorsal surface. So something is started? Where's plant? But plant. This is the a spotted uh, saxifrage, is it? Saxifrage work, you know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, this these wings are a little bit more elongated. Now, this is our largest frillary, the lesser frillary. You notice it's an inch and three quarters. So this is almost like a greater frillary, except it's not silver. And it's definitely more. But this is one of our largest ones. And uh, you can take it, the wings are actually a little bit more extended out, too. They're narrower and longer than we saw in some of the other species. Not that that is an absolute definitive characteristic, but it's something to think about. And that's very orange-dominated, once again, this butterfly. Let's look at the ventral surface. Here's the key, and you saw that in the original picture. Look at this band. This band is as clear as can be. It's a great big band, continuous all the way through. See, that's that canine tooth business, but it's all broken up. And you don't pay any attention to it because it's all part of a band. See, so you don't isolate it like you did the fray for that. It was there, it was obvious, but here it's all part of a band. And it's, uh, you have orange on the outside and orange on the inside. So th this is a major, uh, the size of it, its location, and this, this band, uh, I, I think, are the, the main characteristics that you want to want to look at for the Astartic Framework. Female, once again, no sexual dimorphism. It's very similar. They look alike. Okay, our last, uh, our last uh, lesser fritillary is the Arctic fritillary. Uh, this one I always have fun with because I, I like to hike a lot in the mountains. And this is a companion always alongside the trail. At any of the mountain passes you go to, Chinook Pass or you go up in the Olympics, and because uh, it's, uh, it's very common there. Uh, you see it up in Mount Rainier. You can see the, the subspecies name of this. It's very common in, in uh, Mount Rainier National Park. And uh, so, but this is a higher one now. Now, the western metal fritillary uh, will fly from sea level up to mid latitudes, but then when you get to higher latitudes, uh, not the latitudes, I'm sorry, elevation, uh, the higher elevation, then this one takes over. And this one will fly up much higher. Now, there is some time when the two will fly together. Of course, you're going to have you know, uh, an elevation where both of them will be found. But when you go up to actually the passes itself, this is pretty much the butterfly you're going to see up there. You're already through. All right, let's take a look at the dorsal surface of that. Once again, <laughs> more of the same, orange and black. You're going to say, well, I don't know if that's going to help me any. So let's go to the ventral surface. The ventral surface of the Arctic Fritillary is uh, interesting in that it's, uh, you can see that the, there's a nice yellowish band here, much like the uh, Sardi, of course this is a much smaller butterfly, inch and three eighths compared to an inch and three quarters. So this is a much smaller butterfly, and of course different 
place. You're going to find this like in Mount Rainier. You're not going to find the Astarte in Mount Rainier. And uh, you got your orange basal area. The inner basal area is orange. You have this nice yellow band here. You got a, a smaller white band here. And, uh, and then you have these uh, these uh, crescents, but they're they're irregular. There's a lot of irregular markings here. And you also have some lavender thrown in. So it's a very beautiful butterfly. It's a very very colorful butterfly. And uh, this specimen was taken at Chinook Pass. Actually, it was taken probably about, about by uh, Sheep Lake. I mean, we lead a field trip there in September, and uh, uh, it'll be there. <laughs> Definitely, it'll be there in September. So this will be seen then. Uh, the female, once again, no sexual dimorphism, and so they're they're pretty much the same. Uh, this one was uh, collected at the Horseshoe Mountain, however. Um, Horseshoe Mountain is in Okanagan County, and that's up uh, pretty close to Long Swamp, only, only right next to the Canadian border. I think it's a mile from Horseshoe Mountain to the Canadian border by hiking. So, uh, uh, so you can see that it is it is uh, got quite a range. How did habitat. you sex it? Pardon? How did you sex it? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the best way uh, to do this is the abdomen. If you take a look at the abdomen. Uh, the abdomen, if they're gravid, like this one is, is, is pretty obvious. And a lot of the females are, are easy to identify just because of the gravid uh, abdomen. Whereas right. the males are very, very slim. And also, of course, the, the openings are, are different, too. You can, if you turn it over and look at it, you can see that uh, you know, the external openings are, are different. So, so that way, it, it's pretty easy to tell us. But you're right, because they, they look alike, it could be uh, difficult. All right, let's spend some time on the crescents. There's only four crescents in that line in our state. But now, the crescents are different. Uh, they're still in the same family, the brush foots, and for the same reason. And uh, the, uh, the genus we have is Phytoiotis, or Phytoiotis, and uh, the Phytos means painted. And I tried to look at that for quite a while, and I thought that's hmm. And uh, it must be the ventral surface. They must, the early people who studied this butterfly must have thought, well, it looks like the, the ventral surfaces are painted. So this is where they came up with the name, I guess. I'm just guessing on that. I don't know. A person is probably long dead who gave this his name. So I don't think we can ask him. Uh, the reason they're called crescents is they have a bullet-shaped crescent. Uh, the crescent marks are found in most butterflies. But in the crescents, there's one particular one that is very large and it's sometimes a different color. And that, though, and I'll show you that when we, when we get to some specimens, though, so you get a chance to see them. Uh, so it's a crescent mark. Now, they're mostly orange and black again. You're going to say, oh, no, we back in the fritillaries again? Most of them look like fritillaries. No, they're very similar. They're smaller. They're generally smaller, but they look very fritillary like. We have four species. Uh, in Washington, but this time we go south. They're more common south of us. We're kind of at the northern end. We're at the southern end of the lesser fritillaries. We're at the northern end of the crescents. There are 17 species in Mexico alone. And so uh, they become more common as you go further south. Uh, notice the wingspan is pretty small, from three quarters an inch to an inch and a half. So you see they're, much, they're a smaller on average than the lesser fritillaries. Uh, the species are identified by the dorsal and ventral uh, color. You, you use both for this. But mainly, once again, the ventral, ventral high wings are important. Well, we're going to give you a couple Mexican, just two. Now this is, I want to give you this one because it's an exception to the rule. Remember our black and orange rule? We lose <coughs> this one. This one is the pale bed and crescent from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And uh, very common there. Very common right around the hotel. And uh, you can see that it's basically a dark brown and white. So it deviates from the normal crescent you know, characteristic that we've been talking about. The next one, the pearl crescent, uh, is, uh, has a really wide range. This is very common in the southeastern part of the United States. When my daughter lived in South Carolina, I just walked around her place and these were all over the flowers uh, all around uh, Charleston area. Uh, and they also fly down into Mexico and in the Caribbean. 
So the curl crescent is real common. And once again, we get back to the orange and black theme again. Okay, with this particular crescent. Okay, let's get into the Washington State. Our first one is the Northern Crescent. And the Northern Crescent can be difficult if you don't know its habitat. Because I know, even myself, sometimes I have to think twice because I can get this confused with the field crescent. But you've got to know its habitat. This butterfly basically is, flies in drier areas. We're talking about canyons now. We're talking about like the ponderosa pine forests of eastern Washington, such as Derby Canyon. You, most of you have been up to Derby. This is a good place for this. It hangs out there frequently. It's easy to see. Uh, also, the Tri-Cities area. And those of you who went on the, uh, the uh, conference last year, we saw this on Sunday. Remember out the lake? We, we saw this in quite, quite large numbers. So the Northern Crescent, so see its habitat is more drier. Uh, it's, it's not, it's definitely not what we call a mountain butterfly, okay? <laughs> Just the opposite. So that'll help. If you remember that, that'll help. Now the male uh, is very, it's the most easy crescent to, to identify. It's just easy. Finally we get an easy one. Look at this really large black margin all the way down from far wing to high wing. Very large black margin. That's unique. Also, look at the huge orange area here and here. No black markings in there. It's just lots of orange. This only crescent will be like that. So this, this male will be unique. Okay, the female, well, let's get to the male on the side. Here's the crescent mark I was talking about. You see, all butterflies really have these crescents, but look at these. They always have one that's kind of sticks out. It's all in the same spot. This one's lavender, so it's got a colored crescent mark. But I want you to notice this. This is yellow. The ground color of this hind wing is all yellow, and the markings, you can see the end, you know, orange markings, but then it fades out. It's not, it's not really what I call distinctly marked, uh, but it's very basically yellow. It's a yellow looking uh, hind wing. Keep that in mind with this little crescent mark, and this should help you with the, uh, the northern crescent. The female now is what's confusing, because the female crescent, uh, the northern crescent, is very similar to the female I mean, the northern crescent is very similar to the field crescent, but it's lighter in color. If you really look at the two close up together, this one's more orange, and the, um, the field crescent female is more black. It's darker, much darker, and of course, different habitat. Okay, this one, once again, you're going to find down in the, the canyons of eastern Washington. This is where you're going to see this butterfly. But you have sexual dimorphism now in crescents that we didn't have in the lesser fruitlands. The female is distinctly different from the male. Now, here's the field crescent. Already you can see this is the female here. You see how dark it is? Yeah, the black predominates. Yes. Now, the field crescent is a mountain butterfly. Um, to find this butterfly, you must go to a much higher elevation to see this. Um, cascades, very common in the Cascades, very common in the Olympics, and the Silkers, too, so over in Ponte Rica. Very common. We saw it on our field trip. We also saw. Remember, when we went up to the mountain. Uh, those of you on the the uh, the, the uh, yeah the conference we had. Remember, our first trip we went up in the mountains. Well, we saw this up at the, the high elevations. Remember that. So see, once again, that's where it, it belongs. It, the uh, field crescent is going to be higher elevation, whereas the northern crescent is going to be much lower down in drier areas. All right. Here's the male. Now look at look at. It's almost all black or dark brown. I guess you can call it dark brown to black. But notice that the orange is really restricted on the field crescent. There's not a lot of orange on it. And uh, so that, that makes it really, really kind of unique. And uh, once again, with this habitat being flying high in the mountains, uh, it should help you identify this. The underside now is yellow. Remember I, I showed in the last crescent, it had a yellow-brown color. But notice, this is well marked. The other one was Look at the markings on here. These are pretty well marked, even though it's yellow. And here's the crescent. The crescent mark is yellow, and it's different than the rest of them. And uh, so this will help you with uh, with identifying uh, the field crescent. 
on the ventral surface. The female, you see how similar it is to the northern crescent? See, so you look at it at first glance and say, whoa, it's the same. But it's much darker. It's much darker in color. And of course, once again, the habitat, you're going to find this high in the mountains, not down in Spokane. Okay? So this is uh, the big difference here. You see that. The pale crescent. Ah, one of our rarities. Now, this flies up in Orville as well. Uh, the Sunoki River area, which is just out of Orville, has nice colonies of this, well documented colonies. Trouble is, they fly in May. So, we're going to miss it, unfortunately. But uh, the pale crescent is a really interesting butterfly. I know it's found more widely than it's been, been observed. I mean, I can't believe the, you look at the records, and there's just colony way up here, and there's a colony way down there. There's got to be other colonies we just haven't found of this butterfly. It's more of a drier area, uh, drier canyons. Uh, all of my work with them has been down on the uh, lower granite dam. That's the only place I've seen it, and I've seen it abundantly down there along the Snake River. You walk along the railroad tracks in May, early May, along uh, the, the uh, Snake River there, and uh, look, just look for yarrow. They just, they are absolutely addicted to yarrow. And so they'll be just sitting on yarrow, one after another, all the way down. They're very abundant down there. They were at least when I was there. I've been there three times, and all three times they're abundant in there. And, uh, but they fly with the Melita Crescent. And you might say, oh, it's going to be a problem. No, not at all. Melita Crescent is tiny compared to this guy. I saw both of them on the same yarrow. And one looks like a baby compared to the other one. I mean, it's just really miniaturized. So there's, there's a big difference in size uh, between these. But anyway, uh, the best colony I can tell you about is, is on what, at the lower granite dam on the Snake River below Pullman. That's the place. If you wanted to see this butterfly, I can, I can almost guarantee you'll find it there. Yes, sir? After you told me about the place, I went there multiple times, at least four times. I think I saw one. So, <laughs> that's what happens when you get advice. You know, I don't know. Did you go the first part of May? Yeah, I, I, I bracketed it every, every day that I could think of. But you did see one, so you know it wasn't a total liar. I saw one. Well, yeah. uh, isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> but, you know, and I saw them so abundant when I was there almost every year old <coughs> when I was there. But, you know, that's the way populations are. But you did see one. <laughs> Okay, so well, that's on the, up on the San there's lots of them up there. Up on the San Lejica? The years you were there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. That's one place I, I spent a lot of time in the San Lejica. I've not seen it. Sonocomy. Yeah. Oh, the Sonocomy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the Sonocomy, yeah, I know they're supposed to be there, but I've been there twice, never seen them there. And me. Well, I've been all the way up to Canyon. I took two or three canyons. And I went all the way up. I didn't see one. So see, we both have bad luck with this. Okay. It, uh, it's, a, it's a rare butterfly. It is. Yeah. It is. It is not a common butterfly. This is a this is a large crescent. This is our largest crescent. An inch and five eighths across. So it's a pretty good size. It almost is, you know, like a lesser fruit. So when it's with the melitic crescent, which is <laughs> like half the size, it's pretty easy to distinguish the two. Uh, you have, one thing I want you to uh, help identify this, well first of all it's very rare, so most of you probably never will see it, but if you do see it, this uh, identifiable spot is really good, this black spot here, really large spot, is not found in the other crescents, at least if they do have a spot there, it's not near that size. It's a really nice large uh, spot there that makes this really distinct, rounded margins, and uh, but otherwise, it looks pretty much like a frillary or a crescent. You know, there's not a lot of difference in it. But the ventral surface is unique. This is where it gets the name pale. Because instead of being really yellow, this is basically more white. And that's, I think, where it gets its name pale, because it's almost white in color. And uh, so it loses its kind of yellow. But notice that even though it's very pale in color, it still is very marked. Look at how, how these sills are all very marked. The dark orange here. And there's your crescent mark, which isn't very much different from the others, but it is at least different. And that's, so that's how we call it a crescent. So this is the male underside. The female uh, is a little different than the male, 
Uh, so you can pretty well, you can actually tell it from looking at the dorsal surface. But once again, it's, it's difficult to use the dorsal surface at this point. Lower Granite Dam, Snake River, uh, well, this was on eight, this was April 29th. See, you missed it. You went in May. <laughs> this was collected on the 29th of April. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Now our last one, and this is our last butterfly, the Mylitic Crest. And everybody knows this. I can just zip through this one. This is familiar everybody. This is found almost throughout the entire state of Washington. Uh, very few places don't have this butterfly. And uh, it's very abundant, double brooded. We see it in the spring and we also see it late in the summer. And uh, this one, in fact, this picture right here was actually taken on our uh, field trip when we spoke in. Uh, our, you know, our last conference, summer. our last conference last summer, I got this uh, mating pair uh, and then put it in here. So that was from last Spokane. But uh, it's very abundant and I think most of you have seen this. It's a much smaller butterfly, look at it, it's an inch and a quarter. And so it's, it's, it uh, is dwarfed by the uh, pale crescent when they do fly together, which they do down in the lower canyon uh, granite uh, dam area. But uh, it's, a, it's a pretty small butterfly, but once again, it looks very, uh, very crescent-like or very fritillary-like. Let's take a look at the undersurface. There's really not a lot of distinction here. There's, no, there's not that black spot here. So like if you're down in lower granite dam and you saw the two together, you notice this doesn't have that really huge black spot. So you can say right there, well, I know it's, it's different. The ventral surface is also different. Remember the pale crescent uh, was almost white and it's almost all one color. Now we get back to multicolored, um, band, we, got band, we got banding too. We got this band here of um, yellow and then we have this band here and, uh, and then we have it uh, kind of like a checkerboard appearance all around. And then we have, look at this crescent mark, it's very distinct, which it wasn't in the pale crescent. Very distinct here. So the myelita is different. These are, I know these are little kind of picky things, but you have, when you work with these butterflies, they're difficult butterflies, you have to be observant of these little picky things. That's the, that's the way you get it done. The female is bigger than the male, generally, and uh, it's uh, it's a little bit different in the dorsal surface, but basically it's pretty much the same in the ventral surface, it's the same. So this pretty well does it. So we got through them all. Yeah, yeah. Pretty obvious, I think, but are these illustrations out of your book? Yes, but yeah, this stuff, all of these pictures and stuff all came from my photos. Yeah, Bob think, didn't uh, pay me to ask that question. <laughs> thank you, Al, and thank you all for showing up. Yeah. That's very nice. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Okay.